All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so tonight, tonight we're going to have fun. Uh, we're going to look at a new sutta. We are still going to be exploring the middle-length discourses of the Buddha. So we're still in the Majjhima Nikaya. Uh, but we're going to be jumping over to Sutta number 43 tonight. This is going to be the Mahavedala Sutta, uh, the great discourse with some questions and answers. <laughs> um, it doesn't sound exciting, but I actually think it it, it is. So um, let's see, a few things that we need to know about this Sutta before we dive in. So... This is one of those interesting suttas that we have to pay very close attention to. And what I mean is, is that this is one of those suttas where there's no Buddha. It's one of those older suttas from the Pali Canon where it's actually a discourse with Shariputra or Sariputta in the Pali. Um, and so it's just a conversation between the Maha uh, Kotihita and Shariputra. Now, what that means is, is that this is sort of a particular kind of a sutra. And what we're going to notice is the monk uh, Kotihita, I think that's how you pronounce it, Kotihita, but that monk has some questions. And is going to Shariputra, the Shariputra the wise, to clarify a few things. And this type of discourse where people are going to Shariputra in order to clarify the meaning of Dharma, like clarify the meanings of things, I kind of want to remind you that there's, you know, these three different divisions of all of the Buddha's teachings, they divide them into the sutras, into the Vinaya, and then into the Abhidharma. And a lot of times, as we've noticed, you if you've been coming to Dharma doors for a while, you may have noticed that sometimes there's things in the sutras that have to do with kind of the, the discipline, the, the Vinaya. But it's a sutra because it's thus have I heard one time the Buddha was in such and such a place. And so often we will find the same information, the same discourse in the sutras. And we also find it in the Vinaya because it has to do with discipline. Well, a lot of times information from the sutras spills over and is part of the Abhidharma, that third category. And so this is tonight, basically what I'm getting at is, is that even though we're doing a sutra, what we're doing tonight is actually kind of Abhidharma work, the kind of the meta dharma, if you will, where it's not that we're studying the teachings of the Buddha, we're analyzing the teachings of the Buddha. This will make more sense when we kind of get into the sutra, but I wanted to let you know about that ahead of time, that there's not going to be any Buddha tonight, and we want to kind of pay attention to that. Um, the other thing that we're not really going to see with this sutra tonight, there's not really a story. You know, a lot of times the sutras that we do, are, especially the ones that I choose for Dharma doors, they're often kind of very uh, narrative driven. They'll have a kind of a story that we're interested in seeing how it plays out. But tonight, no story, no Buddha. It's actually just a bunch of, again, clarifying questions. So let's go ahead and dive in and we're going to see how this goes. Um, again, this is Sutta number 43 in the Majjhima Nikaya. Oh, actually, even before I start reading, the title. So I want you to know that the title of this, so this is a, a Maha Sutra. So it's a, it's a big one. There is a Chula Vidala Sutta, a little version or a little 
um, yeah, little version, but we're doing the maha. And then this word vedala. In all of my research, this kind of this week, getting ready for tonight's Dharma talk, there seems to be a little bit of um, uncertainty about what exactly the meaning of this word is. But in my research, I wanted to share with you something interesting. So this word tonight, Vedala, the root of the word is Veda. And you may have heard of the Vedas. The Vedas are indeed this kind of um, a genre, if you will, but a, a type of really uh, ancient Indian literature, poetry, the Vedas. But that word Veda, it actually means a feeling. And I only, I only learned this, uh, I think, yesterday, that in Buddhism, we talk a lot about Vedana. And Vedana is, and actually it might even come up tonight, but Vedana are like bodily sensations. Well, that's Vedana, like sensations, but just a, a feeling is a Veda. <laughs> and it's related to this topic tonight. And so I just want you to know that this, the title of the sutra is connected to the idea of the Vedas, at least as far as a kind of um, um, a preserving of a certain kind of knowledge about feelings, it would seem. So... That's the name of the sutra, but it's just translated loosely as a series of questions and answers. So, thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's park. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Maha Kothita rose from meditation, went to the Venerable Sariputta, and exchange greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to Venerable Sariputta, One who is unwise, one who is unwise, is said, friend, with reference to what is this said? One who is unwise. So, just want to share with you where we're going to go, and then I'll finish the reading. So, Kotahita has asked Shariputta, what, what, do, what does it mean, unwise? <laughs> in, in other words, the Buddha is always talking about wisdom and not being wise. What, do we, what, what does unwise mean? Dupanya is the, the word. So not, or the kind of lacking panya. And panya is the Pali pronunciation of pranya, the Sanskrit word pranya for wisdom. So dupanyo, dupanya is sort of lacking pranya, lacking wisdom. What does that mean, Sariputta? Sariputta tells us, <clears throat> One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That's why it is said, one who is unwise. And what doesn't one wisely understand? One does not wisely understand that this here is suffering. One does not wisely understand this here is the origin of suffering. One does what not wisely understand. This is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That's why it's said, one who is unwise. All right. Um, and actually, just so that we don't get too waylaid this evening, 
let's kind of just finish this section and then we'll have the talk. So <clears throat> saying, good friend, the venerable Mahakotita delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputra's words. Then he asked him a further question. <laughs> Pranya, one who is wise, one who is wise, it is, is said, friend, with reference to what is it said, one who is wise, one who has pranya? Well, one wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend. That's why it is said one is who wisely understands or one who is wise. And what does one wisely understand? One wisely understands this is suffering. One wisely understands this is the origin of suffering. One wisely understands this is the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands. One wisely understands, friend. And that's why it's said, one who is wise. <clears throat> so, what does it mean to be wise? <laughs> According to Sariputra, to be wise is to understand the Four Noble Truths, right? If, if you didn't recognize it, if you didn't catch it, those are the Four Noble Truths. Sariputra, Sariputta gives the, you know, the classic formula for delivering the Four Noble Truths, which is this, you know, it's this interesting idea of this, this is suffering. Now, you can interpret this a lot of different ways, and I don't want to kind of, I don't want this to turn into a Dharma talk on the Four Noble Truths, because we could easily talk about that all, in, all evening. I do want us to kind of just reflect for a moment that there's kind of like one interpretation of what kind of just happened or what was just said, and it's it could be interpreted that one who is wise, or one who is not wise in that sense, but one who is wise understands what, what suffering is, understands what's causing suffering. They understand what it would mean for that suffering to end. And they know the way to bring that cessation about. That's one way to kind of interpret the Four Noble Truths, right? or at least interpret this sutra's presentation of the Four Noble Truths. One way is to think, okay, so Shariputra just said, what, is, what, what does wisdom mean? To know what suffering is. But there's another way to interpret or listen to the, that teaching of the Four Noble Truths, and it's not that, suff that knowledge or wisdom is knowing what suffering is. Wisdom is knowing that this is suffering. And I'm I'm kind of always like emphasizing that the language of the Four Noble Truths is very much this um what's I wrote down the language, but this idam idam dukkha, ayam dukkha samadaya. It's the language of idam dukkha. In Pali, from what I understand, it's saying, this, this is suffering. <laughs> what exactly is the Buddha talking about? What is he pointing at when he says that? Is he saying that, oh, and by the way, what I'm talking about right now is how sometimes the noble truths or the first noble truth is sometimes interpreted as life is suffering. Now, I'm not a big proponent of that interpretation. I, It's actually, for me, a little too limiting, <laughs> actually. But my point is, is that you can see where there's a little bit of confusion about what is exactly the first noble truth? <laughs> is it that there is suffering? I don't know who would think there isn't suffering. <laughs> is it, you know, what the nature of suffering is? What, you know, these things? So... Let's kind of leave it at this idea, with again, without kind of devolving into a long conversation about the Four Noble Truths. Let's understand that wisdom in the Buddhist tradition, wisdom is about understanding what's causing suffering 
and understanding how to bring that suffering to an end. That's what wisdom is. And what I kind of would like us to notice is that there's a lot of different definitions of wisdom in the world. Meaning one in, one idea of wisdom is that you're, you know, you're very smart in the sense that you you know a lot. Like you've 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 stuffed your brain with a lot of information and you can recall a lot of you know, dates and names and facts and things like that. That that could be one definition of wisdom or intelligence in that way. Okay. There could be another definition of wisdom, and that could be a kind of more spiritual wisdom, like a religious wisdom where you maybe have a, a sort of, oh, you know, a kind of faith-based knowledge of God and in your understanding of God and God's creation, that might be called wisdom. <laughs> Let's notice that in the Buddhist tradition, what wisdom is, is not about how much you know, and it's not this kind of really mystical knowledge of the divine. No, it's actually kind of more straightforward. It's about understanding what's causing one's own psychological distress. That's wisdom. That's I that's why I like Buddhism. <laughs> it's because that's what wisdom is. So, and that's the kind of wisdom that I'm going for myself. So. All right. Any questions about the first section about pranya or lacking pranya? Shouldn't be a big surprise for anybody here to, to hear that that's what wisdom is. <clears throat> Let's go a little deeper. So, uh, Mahakatehita, their next question is, make sure, yep. <clears throat> so, vijnana, consciousness. So, consciousness. Consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is, co is consciousness said? Now, Sariputra, the, the translation here, and there, Bhikkhu Bodhi has good foot, footnotes here. So the translation reads like, so, you know, what is consciousness? It cognizes. It cognizes, friend. That's why consciousness is said. And what does it cognize? It cognizes this is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. It cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend. And that is why consciousness is spoken of. Now, what I want you to know about Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote is he makes it very clear that in the original language, in the original Pali, there's no kind of object to this, and what, or I should say subject to this. He says that he's made it so that it cognizes, it is conscious. But his footnote says that <clears throat> it kind of should read, <clears throat> excuse me, it kind of should read, there is consciousness. <laughs> there is consciousness. That's why consciousness is spoken of. <laughs> so let's kind of keep that in mind that you could you know, maybe read it that way. And so, and you know, what is there consciousness of? There is consciousness that this is pleasant. There is consciousness that this is painful. There is consciousness that this is neither painful nor pleasant. There's consciousness. There's consciousness, friend. And that's why consciousness is spoken of. Now, <clears throat> Katahita has an interesting follow-up question. Pranya and vijnana. So wisdom and consciousness, friend. Are these, are these states conjoined or disjoined and 
Is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? This is a very interesting question. <laughs> is consciousness the same thing as wisdom? Are they the same thing? Are they not the same thing? Sariputra's answer is, <clears throat> Wisdom and consciousness, pranya and vijnana, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. For what one wisely understands, that one is conscious of. And what one is conscious of, that one wisely understands. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. What is the difference between them, you may ask, friend? What is the difference between wisdom and consciousness? these states that are conjoined, not disjoined? The difference, friend, the difference between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, the difference is this. Wisdom is to be developed. Consciousness is to be fully understood. So that you could really think about that one for a while. <laughs> so consciousness and wisdom are not disjoined, so they're not separatable in that way, but there is a difference between them. They're not the same thing, otherwise we would use the same word. We'd use the same language to describe them, right? <clears throat> and so what's the difference between them? Well, wisdom is to be cultivated so, and, but wait, what was wisdom? Wisdom was understanding the Four Noble Truths. So cultivate or develop wisdom and knowledge about the Four Noble Truths. So wisdom is to be developed. <clears throat> Consciousness is to be fully understood. That's the difference. So consciousness is just going to keep consciousnessing, <laughs> right? But through wisdom, we come to have an understanding of what consciousness is sort of is and what it's doing in that way. And what it's doing, according to this, is differentiating and discriminating between what it likes and what it doesn't like. That's what consciousness is up to doing. Wisdom is into fully understanding the Four Noble Truths, so... Any questions about consciousness? <laughs> no? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Um, consciousness is, is one of the skandhas. Indeed, and so is the next, and so is the next. Okay, so the understanding, <laughs> because some of the big picture is that you have to understand the part that each of the skandhas plays in suffering and the and the origin of suffering and the end of suffering is that mm -hmm. right i mean is that kind of where we're going with this yes and <clears throat> indeed let's just talk about it now so when it says that consciousness is to be understood well the next one is vedana feelings and those are to be understood as well and then the next one's going to be perception samya that one's to be understood as well and so what we're getting at is that, yeah, this is about coming to an understanding of the five aggregates. And if I can kind of put it simply, as simply as I can, the basic idea is, is that we start out as creatures, we start out kind of overly identified with the five skandhas. And therefore, because we are overly identified with the body and the of, of the five skandhas, 
when something happens to the five skandhas, it causes us anxiety because we are over connected to it or over identifying with it. Through wisdom, we develop a kind of distance from the aggregates, a kind of almost moving into a state of observing them, but not going along and responding with every change of the skandhas, which is normally what's happening is every time something happens with the skandhas, ah, I'm over here freaking out. But if we can kind of develop mindfulness, and again, that kind of calm, peaceful separation from the aggregates, now we are observing them, be, being fully understanding of them, but not being blown around by them all the time. So, yeah. All right. So speaking of which, let's move on to Vedana. And I want to remind you of that connection with the title of the sutta, the Vedala. This is Vedana. Also, as no mentioned, or as we mentioned, this is another one of the aggregates. So Vedana, Vedana, feeling or sensation. Feeling, feeling is said, friend. With reference to what is feeling spoken about? There is feeling. There is sensations, friend. That is why sensations are spoken about. What does it feel or what is sensed? There is the sensation of pleasure. There is the sensation of pain. There is the sensation of neither pain nor pleasure. It senses, it senses, or it feels, it feels, friend. And that's why feeling or vedana is spoken of. Basically the same thing as, as consciousness in that way, but I will just sort of mention or, or kind of elaborate. When it's talking about this idea of the painful or the pleasurable. Again, the normal default mode for creatures is to pursue pleasure and to avoid pain. And all creatures or all unenlightened creatures in that way are, side, are sort of trapped in this, like maximize pleasure, minimize pain, maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Whereas what I was just talking about a moment ago is developing through mindfulness a kind of distance so that there is the observing of a sensation as being pleasurable. There is the observing of a sensation as being painful or the, there is the observing of a sensation as being neither pleasure, pleasurable nor painful. But the point is, is that the mind that is peacefully observing those states is not moved by those states, is not trying to hold on to the pleasure. It's just observing that there is pleasure. It's not trying to get rid of the pain. It's just observing that there is the pain. And the teaching, of course, is that all these sensations, all of them are arising and ceasing arising and ceasing. And so none of them are permanent. None of them are going to last. But what we could possibly be doing is by responding to them in, in a kind of frenetic way, we're conditioning ourselves to kind of be anxious about these feelings. Again, because we're responding to them too quickly rather than being observant of them. And if we observe them, we will watch them arise and cease. So just want to kind of add that to our mindfulness of the aggregates. Let's find out about perception, samya. So perception, perception is spoken about, friend. With reference to what is perception spoken about? There is perception. There is perception, friend. That's why perception is spoken about. What is perceived? 
blue, the color blue is perceived. The color yellow is perceived. The color red is perceived. The color white is perceived. There's perception. There's perception, friend. <clears throat> That's why perception is spoken of. Now, that's the first part. By the way, that's kind of an interesting um, uh, definition of samnya. It kind of helps us understand samnya, that one of the aggregates is this idea of perception. But notice that Sariputra talks about perception as some, it's something like perceiving color. But we know, of course, that color is a very personal phenomena because of colorblindness. Di different eyes see different colors. So perception, the way you perceive, is a kind of very intimate part of who you are in that way. It's uniquely your own perception in that sense. So just a little side note about the definition of what perception is. It's something like perceiving colors. But now, uh, Katehita has another one of these interesting follow-up questions. So regarding Vedana, Samya, and Vijnana, so regarding sensations, perception, and consciousness, he says, feeling or sensation, Sensation, perception, and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them? Sensation, perception, and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Why? For what one senses, that one perceives. And what one perceives, that one is conscious of. That's why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it's impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Any questions about those three being conjoined and inseparable? Again, I want to remind you that that, that part in particular, like that, that level where it's like this question of our are sensation, perception, and consciousness conjoined or not conjoined? This is classic Abhidharma type of stuff because the, the Buddha doesn't really get into this. The, the Buddha is the one that told us about the aggregates. The Buddha is the one that told us about sensation, perception, and consciousness and clinging and all of that. But these like deeper questions about whether they are conjoined or not, that's Shariputra stuff. That's Abhidharma. So if this is starting to sound a little nerdy, Shariputra is a nerd in that way. He's a total Dharma nerd. So, <laughs> but okay, let's move to the next one because the, the next one is very interesting and it'll give us a lot to talk about. So the question of uh, Mahakatahita is friend. What can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties? We just need to talk about what that means before we can even talk about the answer. So this, so the core of this idea the core of this idea that we're about to talk about is called the mano vijnana. That is what is being referred to as mind consciousness. Now, if you're familiar with your basic Buddhist view of the sentient subject, 
then you know in Buddhism, there are six sensory organs, not just five, but we have six senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body. But then in Buddhism, the brain is the sixth sensory organ. And it's called, or the not that the brain is called this, but when eyeballs come into contact with light, there emerges a vinyana, a consciousness, and it's a kakshas vinyana, eye consciousness. And then there's ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, bodily consciousness. And when the mind or the brain is active, that is called the mano vinyana. And in early Buddhism, the mano vinyana, your brain, the thinking faculty, can be either defiled or pure. And there are varying states of defilement and there are varying kind of stages of purity. But what we're talking about is things like the kleshas. So the defilements such as greed, anger, delusion, but also a major huge defilement of the mano vinyana is the delusion of self, the delusion of atma. The conceit, they call it the conceit I am. So the mano vinyana, the, the mind faculty, according to Bo early Buddhism, is defiled by all of this anger, this like addiction and wanting and craving. And then it's like super stained, super defiled by ego in that way. Now, all a, a lot of, if not all of the practices of Buddhism are about drawing out the poisons, about clearing up the mano vinyana. And so what can happen is, is that you can move from a state of a defiled mano vinyana to a state of a purified mano vinyana. And basically that is the goal of early Buddhism to clear out your defiled mano vinyana. So the question that Mahakatahita asks is, what can be known by purified mano vinyana consciousness released from the five faculties? Very quickly, just because this is like a nerdy, super technical Dharma doors tonight, I want to kind of, I don't talk about this as much as I probably should. The language of faculties, indria. So the language and the idea of faculties, it's really interesting. It's very philosophical. If you study Western philosophy, they're really into faculties. What you basically need to know about a faculty is this. Keep in mind that a blind person, they have an eyeball, or at least, you know, not all blind people have eyeballs, but there are blind people who have eyeballs. So they have the sense organ. What they don't have is the faculty of sight. So notice that there's a difference between the actual organ of flesh and then the faculty of being able to see. They're, they are not actually one in the same thing. So when Buddhism is talking about faculties, they're talking about the, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to smell, taste, and touch. Now, what Katahita just asked about, though, is what can be known by a mano vinyana that's been purified and that is no longer attached to the five senses? So this is a kind of, you know, this would be a mind basically in a form of sensory deprivation brought about through meditation where there is no more 
the the mind is not relating to sights, sounds, smells, flavors, or bodily sensations. So it's just the manovinyana purified. And the question is, what, what can that mind that isn't sensing anything and is purified, what can it know? Friend, by the purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties, the base of infinite space can be known thus. Space is infinite. <laughs> the base of infinite conscious, consciousness can be known thus. Consciousness is infinite. And the base of nothingness can be known thus. There's nothing. <laughs> Friend. Actually, let's hold off on that. We have one more idea. So if you aren't familiar with it, so those three, the base, the ayatana, ayatana of infinite akasha. So the akasha ayatana, the base of space, that can be known by a purified manovinyana unattached to the five senses. Now, the base of infinite space, which I'm sure you're probably aware, but just in case there's somebody out there that doesn't know, in the world of Buddhism, there are these four meditative states of form, materiality, but if you go deeper and the mano vinyana becomes detached from sensing, so there's no more form, no more realm of form because there's no more sensing of materiality. The mind then can move into what are known as the formless realms, also sometimes called the formless jhanas, or in Sanskrit, the formless dhyanas. These are also sometimes called the samadhis, these are also sometimes called samapati, attainments. It's very difficult to get into the realm of infinite space because your manovinyana, your mind consciousness needs to be purified of all the icky, poisonous, greed, attachment, and all of that. So it needs to be purified of all of that. And you need to detach from the five senses. Then you can abide in the on. Actually, I need to, I got to talk about this. I don't talk about this enough either, but again, it's that type of Dharma doors. So this formless realm, the first formless realm that is called this base of infinite space, the language is an ayatana, this idea of a, a base, right? And in Buddhism, when they talk about an uh, ayatana, when they talk about a base, you can think of like a digital camera and the sensor, the sensor on that, you know, the light hits the sensor of your digital camera and that's what captures the image. So that sensor is a base and it's why they call the eyes, not the faculty, but the actual organ is a base. And what I'm getting at is, is that when, you, when you're seeing things and you're hearing things, the base of you doing that is your eyes and visual objects or your ears and sounds. Those are the ayatanas. Those are the bases upon which the consciousness is happening. But when you detach from the five senses, the base is no longer the eyes and sights. The base is no longer the ears and sounds. When you move into the first formless realm, the base is infinite space. 
And what I'm trying to dissuade you from doing is seeing space because you're not seeing anything. The faculty of sight is done. You're not hearing space. You're not smelling, you're not tasting, you're not touching space. So that's where it's a very subtle meditation where in, in sometimes meditation teachers will just talk about vast spacious awareness because again, you're not seeing anything or hearing or smelling in that way. Now, if you successfully do that type of meditation where the base of your, your knowledge, the base of your consciousness is infinite space, you could go even further to realize that there's a kind of consciousness there thinking about the base of infinite space. And so you could even sort of move away from the idea of infinite space, and then it would just be the base of infinite vinyana, infinite consciousness. But even that consciousness is a little too busy in that sense. And so then you could get to the third formless realm and the realization is there's nothing. And now you're in real sensory deprivation. No sight, sound, smells, flavors, tactile objects, and arguably there's no thinking going on either. Because it's there's just nothing. So that's what can be known by a mano vinyana purified and released from the five faculties. Now, you might be asking, because Katahita has a question, which is, okay, so you're in such a, a rarefied state with no sensory perception at all, and there's infinite nothingness, and that's it. Question, friend. With what does one understand a state that can be known? <laughs> so what's knowing that? Friend, one understands a state that can be known with the eye of pranya, with the pranya kakshas, the eye of wisdom. And friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? Shariputra says, the purpose of wisdom, friend, is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning. All right. So now we find we get to this pranya kakshas, and that's the that's the Sanskrit pronunciation of the wisdom eye, the eye of wisdom. So the thing about the eye of wisdom, the eye of wisdom is actually a really kind of um, important part of the Buddhist tradition in that way. You might be aware that there are a few different eyes in the world of Buddhism. There's the fleshy eyes, of which you have two in your head, but there's also something known as the deva kakshas, the divine eye, which is usually traditionally represented as like the third eye in the forehead. Now, the divine eye is an eye that can like see other dimensional beings or ghosts or gods. Uh, the divine eye can kind of see through solid objects, it is said. The divine eye can see vast distances. So, but here's the thing that I want you to know about the divine eye. The divine eye is one of what they call the spiritual faculties Remember what I just said about a faculty? That it isn't the organ, it's the ability to see. Well, it's important to recognize that the divine eye is a faculty. 
And what that means is, is that it it's a, a an ability that in a way can be cultivated in that sense. But I just want to kind of make it clear that it's a faculty so that you don't go looking around for where this eyeball, like the, the deva eyeball might be, because it's not the organ, it's the faculty. Now there's another eye, and it's this one, the eye of wisdom. And the eye of wisdom is, uh, is a whole other eye. It is also a spiritual faculty, by the way. But the eye of wisdom, as described, you know, is this eye that is the eye that sees the base of infinite nothingness, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of infinite space. And I'll share with you really quickly. I'll share, this is my, this is just something that I've come up with, but it's how I understand, or it's, it's an, an example of how I think of the, the eye of wisdom so what it is, is, is that I, I always use this example and it's the example of um, somebody who can track animals, like by using their footprints, right? And something to think about is think about two different people who are going out into the wilderness and they both come across an animal track, a footprint in the mud. Now, both people have eyeballs, so they can both see the animal print, right? So the eyeballs and their faculties of seeing, they can both see the same print. But one of these people is a, is a trained animal tracker. And so when they look at the footprint, they don't just see the, the imprint in the mud but they can see how deep it is. They can see if there's like a slide to the footprint and depending upon the slide, in their mind, they can begin to see the animal that made the footprint. Not only can they see the animal that made the footprint, they can see what direction it was going. They can see how fast it was moving. And what I'm getting at is, is that a trained animal tracker can see through time because the animal tracker can see the past, like where the animal came from, can see the present, like the footprint, but can kind of see the future in terms of where the animal went. The other person, though, who just has regular old eyes, who has not been trained, in seeing foot uh, animal prints they can't see all of that well i think of the eye of wisdom as something like that if you have eyes and you know if you have physical eyes sure you can see all of this just like anybody else with eyes can see it all but can you see how all of this is causing you suffering can you see why it's causing you suffering? Can you see how to stop doing that? Can you see the path that leads to you stopping doing that? If you can see those things, then that's the eye of wisdom. But if you're just like, ooh, give me more, you know, give, give me some more, <laughs> then clearly you're not seeing the source of the suffering in that way. So that's sort of just my little uh, little um, a way of thinking about the eye of wisdom in that sense that maybe brings it down a little bit out of the science fiction realm and a little more understandable. Questions, comments about anything we've talked about so far? I, that one's a tricky one. What is knowable by the purified mind? <laughs> hmm. Gnome. I'm curious why the sutra only stops at the first three skandhas. Are they coming up next? Or I mean, I scanned; it didn't look like it. Does, um, I, I think 
Yeah, because I think it has to do. I I was trying to figure that out myself, mm-hmm. and it seems like because the the sutra is structured in a way, yeah, where it's like building up on certain ideas, and. Yeah, but why leave out samskara? Like, why not talk about that one? I'm not sure. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, uh, disjoined from the five faculties, you mentioned that, you know, this could be <clears throat> a practice of um, uh, just, you know, shutting the senses off. But it could also be just a, a practice of, uh, sort of not putting your attention on them too, right? You don't have to go into a, <clears throat> a sensory deprivation room to do this. Okay, just check. yes. The only reason why I put it in terms of sensory deprivation, though, is because I really wanted to emphasize that these formless realms, you're not seeing anything. And so we kind of need to probably move into a state of sensory deprivation to then move to that deeper level. But I do agree with you that being released from the five faculties could be just not, you know, being attached to them in that way, allowing them just to come and go, uh, rise and cease, but without getting worked up about it. But again, to get to those deeper states, though, I do think there's going to have to be a degree of closing down of the senses in that way. So, Noe? Uh, there we go. Yeah, um, Narvana. Boom. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Off the heat. Off the heat, take it away from shutting, not shutting it down, it's summing it up and removing it. State. Thank you. Excellent, Noe. And on Noe's uh, note about nirvana, I do want to kind of then mention that, you know, the idea here is, is that, and this is again, this is just my understanding. Please take it for whatever it's worth. But it's sort of like, if we're talking about purifying the mano vinyana, purifying the the mental faculty, the idea here is is that you could, you know, go on a retreat, separate yourself from maybe whatever you desire in that way. Like if you're trying to get away from something that you have a problem with or whatever, you go on a retreat, and then. After a few days of meditation, you sort of chill out and yeah, anger diminishes, desire diminishes, delusion diminishes, and then they might, all three of them, all three poisons might come to cessation and you move into a jhana. Then you even move into a formless samadhi. But then it can happen that you then, you know, they ring the bells, the retreat's over, you're on the subway, you're on the bus, you're coming home, and then the the poisons start to come back. <laughs> that is very possible. What nirvana means, to me, my understanding of nirvana, is that you have reached a point where they don't come back. They're gone complete cessation, not just temporarily during a good meditation retreat, but permanently in that way. That's the idea of nirvana, or at least as I understand it. So, Noe? It, uh, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know, because since consciousness that these three things are coming up all together yeah this is happening that's happening what we read earlier if they're all happening and we figure out and, and there's a way of this shutting it you know moving it not take going off the heat 
And of course, then it comes back and then it goes off the heat and you take it off the heat again. It's not a, it's not a destination. It, it's the here and now. So it's an op. It, so yeah, it's just, so does it ever, does it ever continue? I guess it's practice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the here and now is like that line from years ago, you know, what is a lifespan? single breath so i i, I kind of like it's not something to attain it's unattainable <laughs> thank you spoken like a true mahayana buddhist <laughs> and i say i say that jokingly but the hinayana is all about their attainments you know so but the idea that there's nothing to attain is a very heart sutra sentiment Speaking of all of this, though, a lot of Noe's comments really bring us to our next section. So unless anybody has any other comments or ideas. So uh, Maha Katahita, their uh, next question is about right view. Samadristi, Samadhiti. Friend. How many conditions are there for the arising of right view? Shariputra says, friend, there are two conditions for the arising of right view. The voice of another and wise attention. These are the two conditions for the arising of right view. And friend, by how many factors is right view assisted when it has deliverance of mind for its fruit? Deliverance of mind for its fruit and benefit. When it has deliverance by wisdom for its fruit. Deliverance by wisdom for its fruit and benefit. Friend, right view is assisted by five factors when it has deliverance of mind for its fruit, deliverance of mind for its fruit and benefit, when it has deliverance by wisdom for its fruit, deliverance by wisdom for its fruit and benefit. Here, friend, right view is assisted by shila, moral virtue, sruta, learning or hearing, sakacha, discussion, samata, calming or serenity, and vipassana, insight. Right view assisted by these five factors has deliverance of mind for its fruit, deliverance of mind for its fruit and benefit. It has deliverance by wisdom for its fruit, deliverance by wisdom for its fruit and benefit. Okay. So, right view... What are the conditions for right view? So first of all, just in case anybody out there isn't familiar with this idea, a drishti, a view, is a worldview. It is about what you think is going on here. What do you, What is life about? What do you think this is all about? Is it just about maximizing pleasure? and minimizing pain. Some people have that view of life, that that's what life is all about. Just try to have fun. Other people have the view that life has like a spiritual or religious meaning to it. Some people have a, the religious view of a kind of God created world, a God overseeing the world, that kind of a view. Some people are a little more um, kind of more material oriented. And it's, again, maybe about maximizing pleasure, or maybe it's about ac uh, acquiring things. But the point is, is that there's a lot of different views. There's a scientific view, religious view, all kinds of views about what's going on here. And it's a really important part of the Buddhist tradition to have the right view to be seeing this world correctly. That's, it's a very important part 
of the Noble Eightfold Path, as it's called. It's a very important part of Buddhism, the right view. Now, it's often asked in the sutras, what is right view? <laughs> and, you know, that's a tricky question to answer. There's a lot of different ways to answer it. My favorite answer is from the Buddha, from the suttas, from the older sutras. My One of my favorite sutras is the Brahma Jala Sutta, the Brahma's Net Sutra. It's also sometimes called the Sutra on the 62 Erroneous Views. And it's a sutra where the Buddha talks about 62 different competing worldviews that were present, that were popular 500 BC, at the time of the Buddha in India, at least the Buddha could recall or could think of 62 different opinions about what's going on here. And ultimately, at the end of that sutra, when they kind of turn to the Buddha and are like, okay, well, what's your view? What's the Buddhist view? Basically, the right view is to not have a view. There's other answers to this as well. Another answer to right view, by the way, is to view all <clears throat> phenomena as impermanent. <laughs> then sometimes the right view is to view all phenomena as impermanent, a source of suffering, and Ultimately, all phenomena is not being experienced by a subject. In other words, there's no self there actually thinking or experiencing all of this. There is the experience of all of this. There is this experience. But there's nobody having this experience. That's the delusion of self, that somebody's having this experience, not an experience is being had in that way. So that's another definition of right view. And there's even more within the world of Buddhism. But that kind of gives you a sense, I think, of the idea of right view, that it's a that you kind of couldn't really probably be a very good Buddhist in that way if you think it's about acquiring wealth. <laughs> like if that's your view that I, I must acquire things, that's kind of the wrong view. And it's kind of counter to the process of the Buddhism in that way. Whereas there are other ways of viewing the world that are conducive to the Dharma, that are conducive to ending suffering. Things like viewing all things as impermanent. Now, that actually wasn't the question, though. The question wasn't, what is right view? Katahita, the question was, friend, how many conditions are there for the arising of right view? And the answer is, is that there's two the voice of another, and wise attention. Now, one of the things that I want to point, I want to note, because this is a, you know, a Dharma doors, and I want to kind of share some information with you. That idea right there, actually, the idea that Shariputra says that right view comes about, the condition for right view is basically learning from another. And of course, paying close attention, paying wise attention to what they're saying. But the idea is, is that it comes about through a, um, the voice of another. Bhikkhu Bodhi has a footnote, which is that if you've ever heard, and in Dharma Doors, we talk a lot about this elusive character known as a Pratyeka Buddha, a solitary Buddha or a solitary enlightened one. Well, one of the criteria of being a pratyeka buddha, a solitary enlightened one, is that you establish right view not from the voice of another. 
That's what makes you a solitary enlightened one. Now, in addition to that, what I would like to tell you is that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, which is basically also called the Bodhisattva path, in the Bodhisattva path, they actually make a really big deal of coming to certain understandings not dependent upon the voice of another. But they're not kind of talking about a Pratekya Buddha. What they're talking about is that there are certain insights that you just have to have all on your own. You, you can't really be given the insight. It, 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 it would be a, a, a semblance of the insight if I just kind of gave it to you. So I just want you to know that in the Bodhisattva path, they make a big deal of this, the language of hearing it from another, and they turn it around and they say, yeah, and there's other things that you can't hear from another in that way. So just wanted to share that with you. Question? Yeah, Noe. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> How so? Is, is this transmission? Is this where the Zen gets their transmission from? Excellent, excellent insight. No, it is. That is the very idea um, of not using words and letters and not saying it, but just that direct mind to mind transmission. That is where that, yep, great, great insight. All right, really quickly, let's talk about that end part. So not about the two conditions for bringing about right view, but let's talk about the five factors that assist right view. So these five factors <clears throat> are Sheila, moral virtue. Um, and, you know, this is kind of classic Buddhism, but what I want us to kind of understand is that it's a really kind of important part of the Buddhist tradition to understand that when we're talking about morality, we're talking about Shila. And, you know, that's something like, you know, we, we talked about this last week, actually. It's, you know, not killing, not stealing, not lying, avoiding intoxication, avoiding, you know, uh, abusing sexuality. And the idea here is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, those things like being violent or being deceptive, those things actually mess with your mind. They, they mess with your mind and they put your mind in a certain way that makes it difficult to study the Dharma, makes it difficult to practice. And it's I think it's important to kind of understand that Buddhism... And I know that everybody, I know everybody here knows this, but it's important to understand that, you know, Buddhism is not one of these religions where it's like, thou shalt not kill. It's, it's this very rational tradition that's saying, no, 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 violent activity makes you kind of violent and makes you in a certain state of mind that then prohibits you from coming to other understandings. So yeah, it's bad to be violent, but there's a really good reason to not be in that way. Not just because Buddha told me not to. So I just want to kind of clear or mention that about how it is that morality is a factor that supports practice in that way. So, so that's virtue, the first one. The second one is sutta. Now, what I've been wanting to mention this for a while, it would it's starting to seem to me, and if anybody out there knows more of the languages than I do, I'd love to hear from you, but it's starting to, to sound to me like the word sutta, like the sutras. I know that in Sanskrit, they are always talking about how sutta or sutra in the Sanskrit comes from <clears throat> like the basically a word for like to sew and where we get the English word suture. 
And I've heard that etymology forever, and I've repeated that etymology. But as I've been studying more of the Pali, like so more of the original language of Buddhism, I'm beginning to notice more and more that the word for to hear and to learn is sutta. And if you add one more T, it becomes sutta in that way. And what I'm getting at is, is that the etymology that, the, and especially when you realize that all of these begin, thus have I heard. So you could understand the sutras are hearings, things that have been heard. To me, that adds up etymologically really, really well. So just want to put that out there as a possible uh, a possible etymology for sutta. But learning, just sutta with one T, is our, a factor that's conducive to developing right view. And then the one that I really wanted to talk about, discussion. Because this, for me, is the heart and this is what Dharma Doors is all about is the value of discussing the Dharma, that that it's such an important part of the Sangha, it's such an important part of the tradition, is this sort of discussion of Dharma in that way. So I'm kind of happy to be a part of a factor that is supporting right view. Uh, so those are the first three. And then the last two, Shamatha and Vipassana the two classic practices of Buddhism, right? Calming down and cultivating or developing insight, vipassana. So those are the five factors that cultivate and bring about right view. Any questions about that? Then let's talk about bahava. So our next question is, friend, how many kinds of bahava are there? How many kinds of being are there? Sariputta says, there are these three kinds of being, friend. <laughs> uh, Realm of desire beings, kamadatu beings, realm of form beings, and formless realm beings. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future generated? Friend, renewal of being in the future is generated through the delighting in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future not generated? Friend, with the fading away of ignorance, with the arising of true knowledge, and with the cessation of craving, renewal of being in the future is not generated. All right. So a bhava is, you know, it's a trick. It's one of those tricky Buddhist words that gets translated a bunch of different ways. Here, we are sort of talking about the essence of life in that sense, this sort of a kind of life force principle or energy, a bhava, a being of some sort. And the question is, how many types of beings are there? And this is the classic Buddhist, you know, separation of the world into these three realms, the kamadatu, rupadatu, and arupadatu, the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. I know they have like some, you know, very particular language here regarding the sense sphere being, which is the realm of desire the fine material being, which is the realm of form, and then immaterial, formless being. Um, you know, basically the idea here is, is that to be in the realm of desire, the kamadatu, 
that's me and you and all the animals. It's kind of all of all of the copulating creatures of the planet. Because let's remember that the Kamadatu, the realm of desire, is very much about sensual or sexual desire. So there's the beings in the realm of desire, so all the different kinds of creatures in that way. But then there is, there are beings and there is being just in the realm of pure form. And this is basically the realm of a meditator. There are traditionally gods, like divine beings that inhabit the realm of form. Even the god Brahma inhabits the realm of form. But the idea is, is that a meditator can transcend the realm of desire and enter the realm of form. And I want you to know that the language in Buddhism, they the language that they use for a meditator moving out of the realm of desire and into the realm of form, they use the language of being reborn in the realm of form. So they're talking about sort of transcending one kind of bhava, one type of being, and inhabiting a different type of being. Now, don't get too science fiction-y, you know, fantasy about this. Because it's kind of really about, you know, if you look at your own body, you can certainly look at your own body, you can look in a mirror, and you can certainly be looking at your own image in the realm of desire. And in the realm of desire, you might be judging yourself for being, you know, not beautiful enough or having this problem or that problem. But the point is, if there's any kind of like evaluation, certainly any kind of emotionality about the way you look, that's all realm of desire stuff. But if you were really just aware of the solid, liquid, temperature and movement aspects of the body, just to aware of, oh, the bones are more dense then the blood, which is more liquid, and then there's the temperature, and then there's the movement, the breathing. And there's no comparing my physical body to any, it's just, it is what it is in that way. It It's as dense as it is, the liquid is as liquid as it is. So what I'm getting at is, is that to actually stop kind of, obsessing about one's appearance in that way and to just move into a state of awareness of the elemental aspects of the body, that is a rebirth. That is a kind of transcending, but it's a psychological transcending where you're no longer in that body, the body that was all ugly, and you're in just the body that is. But then you could even be reborn again and transcend the realm of form and be reborn in a formless realm, which we already talked about in terms of the base of infinite space, infinite consciousness, and infinite nothingness. But that would, again, that would be a different bhava in that way. All right, so those are the three kinds of bhava, the three realms in which there are beings and the three kinds of beings there. Now, friend, how is reincarnation? That's basically what they're talking about. The renewal of being. How is the renewal of being in the future generated? So what brings about future rebirths? What brings about this, this reincarnation process? Friend, Renewal of being in the future is generated through the delighting in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. And how, friends, is that, is future renewal not generated? Well, with the fading away of ignorance, 
with the arising of true knowledge and with the cessation of craving. Renewal of future being is not generated. So let's just deal with how this idea of not generating future renewal. The Buddha says that this idea of the fading away of ignorance, rising of true knowledge, and the cessation of craving. So this is another kind of teaching that I give a lot. And it's the idea that in some Indian traditions that talk about reincarnation, not Buddhist, but in other traditions, what they talk about, the way that they talk about the renewal of existence, so like reincarnation, they basically talk about it this way. You've done a lot of karmic actions in your life. In fact, you may have done a lot of karmic actions in many lifetimes. And so there's an understanding in some traditions that you have this tremendous backlog of karmic debt from all of these things you've done. And there's one way of thinking, which is that all of that karmic debt has to play out. So in other words, you've already kind of um, determined your own fate by all of your past actions. Now you could kind of like stop, stop performing such karma now, but all of that other karma that you've already done it's got to play out. And that's what will bring about renewed existence in the future. But that's not what the Buddha taught. The Buddha says, no, 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 no. Future rebirth doesn't happen because of all of your past actions. It happens because of what you're doing right now. The ignorance, the way you're thinking right now, your craving right now, and your lack of knowledge right now in that way. And so, in other words, a kind of confusion about things right now is then what brings about this future renewal. So, if you could, if there was the fading away of ignorance, the arising of true knowledge, not diluted knowledge, and the cessation of craving, that would end future renewal in that way. Now, it's gotten late, so as you can tell, I'm not trying to open up a conversation about future renewal, but I do recognize, though, that this, you know, I've left some open-ended questions here. So, and actually, there's some really, really interesting things in the second part of this. So I think we'll come back to this next week and finish up. Um, but otherwise, any last uh, questions, comments, answers, or ideas about the sutra or anything we talked about? Noe? Thank you. Yes. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, no. Going back to oh, that, that line of um, uh, the light in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and feathered by cravings and this really points later to the to the bodhisattva path yeah because this is the, you know oh after you no after you no after you i will wait for all sentient beings first before you know so this sure. is that pointing at that right here is that you know generating delight in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and feathered by craving. Uh, just a comment. Mm -hmm. And we will talk more about that comment next week because I, I do have things to say about that. All right, everybody. Uh, that'll do it for this Dharma Doors. Mm.